Tupac died almost 30 years ago, and at this point, everybody knows about his beef with Biggie, Nas, Jay-Z, Bad Boy. There's hundreds of videos on YouTube covering those stories already, so don't worry, this is not one of those videos. Something that deserves more attention that hasn't received much attention at all is Pac's beef with Mob Deep. So that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm doing a full on deep dive, no stones on turn video on Pac and Mob Deep. So hit the like button. It always helps the video and let's go. I can almost guarantee when you think of this beef, the first thing that comes to your mind would likely be this record right here. Now it's all about Versace. You copy my style. Five shots couldn't drop me. I took it in smell. And everybody knows that Pac dissed Mob Deep on Hit Em Up, but the question is, why did he do it? Well, there's a few different reasons, so let's take a look at each one. Reason number one, Mob Deep's involvement in the East Coast, West Coast War. Way back on September 17th, 1995, the dog pounded Snoop Dogg dropped their track, New York, New York. New York City, Given the fact that these guys were all West Coast artists, they claimed that the track was intended to be an ode to New York, the mecca of hip hop. We really thought that this record will earn us the respect from New York. All we wanted was the respect from New York. The respect from New York. Now, realistically, when we look at this record, is it really a good demonstration of how to show appreciation to New York? Well, the first thing is the hook itself is from Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. A New York, New York, big city of dreams, but everything in New York ain't always what it seems. Mind you, the hook is slightly modified, and where Melly Mel says, I'm down by law and I know my way around, Snoop says, I'm down by law and I'm from the dog pound. What's even more interesting is the beat itself was actually from a beer commercial that Biggie did for St. Ides. That was a Biggie Smalls beat for a St. Ives commercial. And, you know, even though Biggie used it in the commercial, sonically, this is clearly a, a West Coast beat. There's nothing New York about it. In fact, DJ Pooh actually produced it. So, realistically, the only part of this record paying homage so far is the Melly Mel hook. But what about the verses? With a touch of this twister, stylistic mixture. There is literally nothing said on those verses that would make anyone believe that these guys are paying homage to New York. In fact... I could see how people would take it as the opposite. If the goal is to make a record that shows appreciation to New York, you'd think that the verses would reflect that. Like, name a landmark, talk about Cool Herc, talk about Millie Mel, talk about the South Bronx. Like, I don't think they sold it with this record. Look, I can't speak for these other YouTubers, but my viewers like to be fresh, like to be clean, like to smell good, which is why you guys are gonna love Scentbird. Scentbird delivers a new fragrance to your doorstep every single month, and all you need to do is select the fragrance that you want, pay $17, and they'll do the rest. And they've got over 700 fragrances to pick from. So there's Gucci and Prada, Versace, all those are there, plus a whole bunch more. So your first order is gonna come in this sleek little magnetic case, and all you do is simply pop it open and you can interchange each vial. And every vial has 120 sprays in it, so, I mean, I only do one, two sprays tops. We're not, we're not trying to scare the women away here. So realistically, each vial should last you at least two months. And there's no need to worry about hidden fees because in Canada and the US, shipping is 100% free. I really like this company because like this bottle right here cost me 120 bucks. And when I do the math on it, I could have had seven scent birds for the cost of that. So like seven new fragrances to try. And if you use the code DIRT55, you're also going to get 55% off your first order. And they sent me three different fragrances to try and out of the three, I really, really like Brioni, but the best of them all is definitely Commodity Moss. Like to me, they should rename it Panty Dropper 5000 because <laughs> it is the one, trust me. All the links for Scentbird will be in the description. And thanks to Scentbird again for sponsoring this video. 
So whether or not they were really paying much respect to New York, in my view, is very debatable. And the timing of the record really wasn't the best either, because just one month earlier, Suge Knight went off at the Source Awards. Come to death row. And as everybody knows, Snoop was pissed off because even he got booed when he was doing his set. The East Coast don't love Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. The East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row. Y'all don't love us. So dropping a very debatable appreciation record just one month after the Source Awards probably wasn't the best strategy. But the Dog Pound and Snoop Dogg had a solid plan for the music video as they were going to fly to New York, meet up with a bunch of local rappers, and film some shots in the mecca of hip hop. I mean, I guess it's a decent plan, but things definitely didn't pan out. The famous rumor is that when they arrived, Biggie called into Hot 97 Radio. It's alleged that Biggie sounded the alarm and let the people of New York City know that West Coast artists were in the city filming a video and that they shouldn't tolerate the disrespect. Biggie was on the radio telling them like, yeah, y'all gonna let them come down here in our city and da 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 and they down there in Times Square. Go handle that. Now the audio itself has never leaked of Biggie doing this, but enough people have confirmed it over the years where I believe that it actually happened. But he was asking Brooklyn how they was gonna let that happen. How you gonna let them come disrespect, you know, New York like that? I also found that the story was verified by multiple people online who claimed that they heard it on the radio themselves. I heard it as a child. I think he said something like, yo, they out here shooting a video, disrespecting us out here. So slightly after Biggie makes that call, the dog pounded Snoop's trailer gets shot up. All we gave a fuck about was winning over New York and they shot at us, cuz. And after he made that call, then Goon showed up and the trailer was shot up. And that was enough for them to change their plans for the music video, and instead of showing love, they decided to kick over famous buildings in New York instead. I'm all ready to put work in. And at this point, Mob Deep enters the equation as they jumped on a Nori and Capone record called LALA. General, Emmanuel, Rock and Morale. The record was in response to the Dog Pound video where Prodigy can be heard using the Melly Mel hook again. You might get fooled if you come from out of town cause we coming from Queens to get down. So Prodigy, he was only on the hook and then Havoc had the verse. In the front, gotta lock my lives in the back. And in my opinion, I think Tragedy easily had the best verse on this track. Like he he killed it. Dried up, laying in the box from the virus. Commercial thugs try to bust gas at the live. And you know, Tragedy even admitted that the intent was not to diss them, it was to go light. So this track again, no real direct shots. We never really went at nobody because what I said, yes. I said they didn't really go at us. They didn't go at us. So let's yeah, not go. just referencing. So let's not go at them, but let's, we're going to throw a warning this shot. Is, this is history right here. Yeah, we're going to throw a warning shot history. the way they threw a warning shot. As far as the history of this record, Prodigy always claimed that it was all his idea. A couple of people had something to say, you know what I'm saying? A couple of them, but we were like the first ones to say something like, yo, just go back at the niggas basically and hold down New York. In Prodigy's book, My Infamous Life, he outlines a similar story saying, when Snoop and the Dog Pound's New York, New York video came on TV, Ron, Du, Gotti and I immediately looked at each other and said, these dudes is trying to play us. In the book, Prodigy paints the picture that LALA -A -A was a mob deep record. The first song we made, LALA, -A -A, features Capone and Noriega and was aimed at Snoop and the Dog Pound. However, Nori and Tragedy had a completely different story, and they pretty much called Prodigy a liar, more or less. Bro, you took your verse over of LALA. -LA. How you gonna sit here and try to take credit for this shit, bro? And I never said nothing. One thing that can be verified is that Prodigy did have a verse on the track, but removed it and put it on a Nas song instead. JFK on our way to LA Got links with big gas down to send the ball break So it's really that line, the JFK on our way to LA That would have been the only direct shot on that track, really But again, it went on the Nas record What's clear is that at the time of the New York, New York record Tupac was incarcerated at Rikers Island 
Dog Pound video came out in New York, New York. And I'm not saying you was in the video. I know you wasn't in the video. I wasn't but in it. I didn't write it. I didn't produce the beat. All right, so let's I take was that. in jail. The album was done while I was in jail. That's separate. While Tupac was inside, a few of the prison guards actually knew Mob Deep personally. And Pac told them to let Mob Deep know that he thought they were really dope. I was in Rikers giving these niggas love, Mob Deep. The guard knew him. I was like, tell them niggas I love them niggas. When they first came out, Pac loved Mob Deep. He was a fan of Mob Deep. Like, he loved him. Which really makes sense because Mob Deep used to do shows out at Rikers Island way back in the day. See them perform on Rikers Island. They performed a free concert for all the right for that. However, before Tupac got sentenced, he said that anyone who was acting out of pocket while he was inside would get it back tenfold when he got out. And uh, he definitely, definitely was not lying. Prodigy was also featured on an LL Cool J and Keith Murray track called I Shot Ya. And Tupac was very paranoid at the time. And he automatically assumed that the song was about him. And even when Pac saw Keith Murray, he pressed him on the issue. It was like this. They was ready to get busy. And mind you, we have pokers. They have pokers. They were ready to get busy. He was like, yo, now, nah, Murray. I got shot five times. I don't know what happened. I don't know who did what. I don't know who did what, 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 what. So the East Coast, West Coast thing was really heating up and Pac looked at the situation and he's probably thinking, okay, these Mob Deep kids are on two different tracks now against me. These guys are clearly my enemies. Many, many, it's time to begin again. Forgot what I already knew, you hear me, friend? Now, there was an unreleased diss record from Dog Pound and Tupac that was released in 2011 called NY87. The record is very direct, very ruthless, and had it got released at the time, it would have definitely added to the problems. DJ Quick starts out the record with a shot at Source magazine and confirms that the East Coast is indeed their enemy. If you're looking in the Source mag and don't see me, it's because them niggas on the East is the enemy. It's real. Corrupt continues on and drops the same bombshell that we learned about on Hit 'em Up, where Pac alleged that he smashed Biggie's wife. Keep in mind, I don't know when this was recorded, but I'm pretty sure it was before Hit 'em Up. Corrupt then brings up how the dudes in the East set up Pac to be killed, and then they tried to do the exact same thing to them. Same nigga setting the homies up and shit trying to set us up. Corrupt then defends the New York, New York track and runs with the narrative that the East Coast blew things out of proportion. Shit scorching. We want a video for a song that got blew out of proportion. Corrupt then sends a shot at Mob Deep and a tribe called Quest. Nigga, we Mob Deep. So fuck you, J. Rue, and any tribal quest to compete. We the elite. He ends off the verse to let the East Coast know that it's on site when they land in LA. The psycho assassin is blasting, and next time you hit LA, nigga, we mash. Tupac then goes in and lets it be known that it's fuck New York. Move motherfuckers till they feel me. It's West Coast, nigga. Fuck New York. Now can everybody hear me? He ends off the verse by letting them know that he didn't appreciate it when they shot at his guys. You shot at my homies, now I'm a blast. Streaming thug life, motherfucker, when I pass. Now, again, when this was recorded, I don't know, but I feel like it does fit in somewhere in this storyline around here where it seems to be to me a response directly to the LALA joint where they're actually coming back and saying this is an actual diss and now we move on to the second reason why Pac diss Mob Deep reason number two survival of the fittest while Tupac was inside he had an interview in Vibe magazine stating that he was changing his ways he was reading books, he wanted to be sober, and he said that thug life wasn't something that he was going to be embracing anymore. After the first two days the weed was out of me, I made up my mind I wasn't going to smoke anymore. That's when I started finding a little piece of myself and started figuring out what was going on. Then I started seeing my situation and what got me here, that is why thug life to me is dead. If it's real, then let someone else represent it because I'm tired of it. I represented it too much. Now, it's not uncommon to put on a good face for the press when you're in a situation like Pac was, but in my opinion, I do think he had good intentions before 
getting entangled with death row. However, Tupac took issue with Mob Deep when on their track, Survival of the Fittest, the hook says, Thug Life, we still live in it. Pac took this as disrespect as the Vibe magazine where he stated that he was done with Thug Life had released in April of 1995 and just one month later, Mob Deep drops their single claiming to be keeping it going. These niggas in Mob Deep is little kids. When I was in jail, when they came out with that song, where they was like, Thug Life, we still living it. You know, when that song um, that they had, they were talking about, yeah, they was like, Thug Life, we still living it. I took it as a diss. So from jail, I'm calling my little homies in Atlanta like, yo, they got a show out there. Get with them busted. Thug Life was a Tupac thing. He was in a group called Thug Life. He had it tatted across his stomach. It was a lifestyle that he personified fully. So when Pac saw they did this, he took it as disrespect, like they were kind of calling him soft now and acting like they were the real deal. So it was for that reason that Pac sent goons to Atlanta to run up on Mob Deep, and Prodigy also spoke about this in his book. In one of his interviews, Pac spoke about a time he and his crew bumped into Mob Deep in Atlanta and how they had us scared. When I heard that interview, I didn't know what Pac was talking about. We never crossed paths with him or his crew. After a while, I remembered some dude screaming thug life as we left the in-store appearance. That must have been what Pac was talking about. Some meaningless bullshit. And everybody claimed Pac was paranoid, and that's probably true, but I do agree with him on this. I think he caught this one. I think Mob Deep was sending a little shot and he, and he caught it. But when he's in prison, he kept hearing them doing songs and you know, he, they were saying stuff like Thug Life, we're still living it. After he put a, the Vibe interview out saying that he's no longer living Thug Life. You know what I mean? So Pop felt like they was take, they taking shots at him now. Now we move on to reason number three, Shook One's part two. Another theory that bounces around is that Tupac felt like Mob Deep also sent shots at him on Shook One's part two. People claim that Pac felt slighted because he thought the words some got locked down and turned nuns was in reference to him leaving Thug Life behind after he got incarcerated. But the theory's stupid because Shook One's part one it's just called Shook Ones, but part one, the first one they put out was in 94. It had the same hook. And numerous ways that we choose to earn funds, earn funds. Some niggas get shot, locked down, and turn guns. Now, I'm not saying Pac didn't hear Shook Ones part two and maybe feel a way about it. He was paranoid, but it's just a theory. Now that we've went over the reasons for why Pac diss Mob Deep, let's take a look at the disses that came after. Biggie, remember when I used to let you sleep on the couch and beg a bitch to let you sleep in the house? On June 4th, 1996, Tupac, along with the Outlaws, released Hit 'em Up. At this point, most of the disses were all subliminal, so Pac came in and basically said fuck dancing around who I'm talking about, I'm gonna make sure everybody knows. The record created a tidal wave across the industry where he dissed multiple East Coast artists, but for the case of this video, we'll only touch on the disrespect towards Mob Deep. Oh yeah, Mob Deep, <laughs> you wanna fuck with us? You little young ass motherfucker. In the first line, Pac calls out Mob Deep directly by name, alluding to the fact that they were a bunch of young dudes that were trying to get into the mix. No one of you niggas got sickle cell or something. You fuck with me, nigga, you fuck around, have a seizure, a heart attack. You better back the fuck up before you get smacked the fuck up. Pac then ruthlessly brings up Prodigy's lifetime disease with sickle cell. Sickle cell disease is an inherited blood disorder. Therefore, it's lifelong. Prodigy actually released a record a few years later where he really paints the picture of what it was like living with this disease. 1974, motherfucker, I was born with pain. My mom's and my pops pass it down to me. In Prodigy's book, he described what it was like when he heard Hit Him Up for the first time. Somebody in QB played it for us on a little boombox outside. Yo, Pox dissing y'all. It was cool, but he couldn't fuck with us. Why the fuck is Tupac coming at us? It took me a minute to figure out why he was dissing us. Then it came to me that he had just signed to Death Row and Snoop was his label mate. So Pac decided to take it upon himself to jump into the drama. Picking over our buildings in the video, stomping through the city. It's like real disrespectful shit that they, you know, you know, it's just, 
They knew that was disrespectful, you know what I'm saying? They knew we went back at the niggas, you know what I mean? We made our version LALA. I guess when he seen that, he figured, all right, now I'm going at these niggas. But Mob Deep did come back with a record of their own, and practically three months later, they released Drop a Gem on them. But you yell my name, that's only giving me props, plus the fans that you got, where the rim was got you high. In Havoc's verse, he brings up the fact that Tupac dissing Mob Deep on Hit Em Up only helped the Mob Deep brand. And Havoc admitted in many interviews now that when he found out Pac dissed him, he was hyped. I mean, the biggest artist in the world, the biggest rapper in the world, just took a bright light and shined it on your career. I mean, of course he was happy. You know what I'm saying, Tupac? You know what I'm saying? Like, he shouting you out in the song. It's all good, let's let's go. Like, so we we, we made drop a gem on him. It's too not knocked out the box and got rock, got raped on the island, you officially die. Havoc runs with the narrative that was in circulation at the time, that Pac was raped while at Rikers Island. This was a rumor that Wendy Williams started, which has never been confirmed, and Pac is always denied. You know why it was difficult for me? Not that somebody said I got raped in jail. It was difficult because people was believing it. Kick that dog shit, buy a magazine or some love shit, keep it real, kid, because you don't know who you fucking with. Havoc then brings up Tupac's interview with Vibe magazine, where he was acting all kumbaya and saying that he was done with thug life and lets him know that he doesn't know what he's getting himself into by going at New York. And Havoc's verse was definitely fire, but Prodigy's verse? It's out of here, man. Let's listen. Rikers Allen flashbacks of the house you got scuffed it in. You would think that getting your head shots enough, but then. And it fucking killed me to have to put this record on here without the beat. Because the beat of Drop a Gem on them is what makes Drop a Gem on them Drop a Gem on them. That grimy, those grimy keys. But I ran into a bunch of copyright shit, so there was nothing I could do. And I had to do with the acapella shit. But it's just not the same. It really isn't. Prodigy brings up the Rikers rape allegations again and mentions the Quad Studios incident when Tupac got shot in the head twice. Prodigy then questions how Tupac didn't learn from that encounter to not go against the East Coast. So Pac thought that he got set up and, you know, Prodigy's kind of leaning into that narrative a little bit, really just fucking with his head. Now you want to go on my team, must have been drunk when you wrote that shit. Too bad you had to did it to your own self. Prodigy assumes that Tupac had to have been drunk when he recorded Hit Him Up, and in the second line, he dishes out a double entendre where one, he alludes to Tupac's self-sabotaging ways, he's doing it to himself, and two, he's referencing the Quad Studio shooting where Pac allegedly shot himself in the groin in the process of protecting himself. Clocks tick, your days are numbered, in low digits, you look suspicious, suspect niggas is bitches. The first line is definitely eerie, as Prodigy essentially predicts Tupac's fate by claiming that his days are numbered. You need to run behind shit, you gotta get, you better find it and use that shit. Think fast to get reminded of robberies in Manhattan, you know what happened, 60 G's worth of gun clapping. This is another sequence of lines that's related to the Quad Studios shooting, where Prodigy is pointing out that Tupac got robbed for 60k in jewelry, and next time, if he's got a gun, he should use it. Who shot her? You probably scream louder than an opera. New York got her. Now you want to use my mom as a crutch. What you think you can't get bucked again, once again? Prodigy references Biggie's track, Who Shot Ya, which was something that Tupac was pissed off about at the time because he thought that it was a reference to the Quad Studio shooting. And in my opinion, look, like when it comes to bars and lyricism and piecing up syllables and double entendres and writing and just the flow of it all, like no one on the West Coast could fuck with Prodigy. And that's just a, to me, that's just a fact. Drop a Jam on him was getting some radio play at the time, but just weeks after it was released, Tupac was killed in Las Vegas. And just out of respect for mourning the loss of Tupac, Mob Deep pulled the record. However, they didn't pull it entirely as two months later, the record would get released on their Hell on Earth album, along with another track that had more shots for Tupac. Swollen bullet wound head ass. Yo, yeah. who's the one to be? Made it to a sample. Prodigy immediately starts out his verse with a subliminal for Tupac, referencing when he got shot in the head. 
In the second line, Prodigy assumes that Tupac was trying to diss Mob Deep to set an example for other East Coast artists, but Pac is the one that got shot in New York, so who really needs an example? Got juiced up, now Bishop think he dug in his black pimp was rapid taste, he gets a little head pinched off. Prodigy references Tupac's movie Juice, where the character that he played goes by the name of Bishop, and Prodigy feels that Suge Knight put a battery in Pac's back, and that the death row cosign was going to his head. Strictly Dog Boy, Stand up. Thug, boy. The, real thug life, nigga. the track is ended with more clear shots at Tupac, where Mob Deep claims that they're the real thug life. That's the thing about Mob Deep, man. Like, Havoc was an amazing producer, still produces to this day. And a lot of those classic records that we love, these classic beats, he made them in Queens, like as a kid. Like, the dude is a phenomenal producer. I just wanted to share that with people that don't know. And although Tupac was gone, what's clear is that his last few months on Earth were heavily invested into creating more disc records, starting with Bomb First. I mean, that's the thing with Pac. He let the pen bleed. You could really feel what he was talking about. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot to unpack with this record, but this video, again, is about Mob Deep. I'm a bad boy killer, Jay-Z got to, looking out for Mob Deep, nigga, when I find you. Pac claims that he's looking for Mob Deep, and when he finds them, it's gonna be trouble. This was something that Prodigy had also mentioned in his book as well. To tell you the truth, we felt sad when he was killed, but relieved at the same time. It would have seriously been a problem if we ever clashed with him. We were glad it never got to that point. Did you ever have any ill will towards him? Oh yeah, I wanted to kill that nigga. Yeah, hell yeah, I wanted to fuck that nigga up, jump him, cut him, shoot him, all that shit. Cause it was beef, he was shitting on niggas. We were shitting on them and it was gonna be a problem if we ever saw each other. And it was on the exact same album as Bomb First where Pac had even more shots for Mob Deep. Mob Deep wonder why nigga blow them out. Next time grown folks talking, nigga close your mouth. Be on many occasions, Pac referred to Mob Deep as just young kids. And in his personal notes about this album, he wrote, Thanks to Mob D for opening your mouth and letting me squash your no record selling asses to dust. The next record is one of my favorite Tupac songs, When We Ride on Our Enemies. I murder you, then I run a train on Mob D. Don't fuck with me, nigga, you're barely living. Don't you got sickle cell? See me have a seizure on stage? You ain't feeling well, hell. Again, Pac talks about Prodigy's battle with sickle cell and continues to send more threats to Mob Deep. And look, I know people are gonna be like, you're so young, what do you know about Pac? You're a white boy from Canada, but don't make assumptions, man. I'm 35 now, and I became a fan of Pac when I was like nine, 10 years old. In fact, here's a photo of a very young me throwing up the west side at my little brother's birthday party. And what a ridiculous thing to do at my brother's birthday party, but I literally thought I was like that guy, you know, I thought I, I thought I was Tupac. I thought I was on the West Coast. I wasn't in Canada. He had taken me off to some faraway land. The next disc record to get released will be a track with the outlaws called Die Slow. First of us, who do we trust? I'm from Mob Z, and Jay Z, dead to dust. I told you punks that I was after Biggie. Mob Z, you little young ass juvenile. Pretty self-explanatory, but the word juvenile could also be in reference to Mob Deep's first album, Juvenile Hell. The next diss would come on a track called War Games. And something I almost forgot to mention was that Pac was obsessed with this book. And uh, you could hear a lot of references to it in his later music where <laughs> it's pretty clear that he took this book pretty seriously. What's extremely apparent is that Tupac was in a hell of a dark headspace for the last few months of his life. It seems like every time he touched a studio, a new disc record was created, and who knows how many other unreleased tracks there are. It's hard to say what would have happened had Tupac not lost his life on that fateful night, but things look to be headed in a bad place regardless. Unfortunately, in 2017, we also lost Prodigy, so at the end of the day, we lost two hip-hop legends that will certainly never be forgotten. So rest in peace to Pac, rest in peace to Prodigy, and I'll see you guys on the next one. The guy did a good job. He did. He did a good job with that. It came across my feet. Edit. Good to see it edited correctly. Yeah, what's the dirt? Bitch, I'm about to blow up. 
Uh-huh. Say what? Bitch, I'm about to blow up. And once again, guys, don't forget about Semper because this is not the last time these guys will be on the channel. I definitely feel like this is a good fit for my audience and for my channel. I think it jives really well. I really like the company. I'm really rocking with them. They're rocking with me. So definitely show support. Definitely check them out. I really recommend it. Definitely a cool company.